What are you doing here? Getting you out. Here, put this on. You'll need it. The year is 2006. The Xbox 360 had launched last holiday, and the shooter genre is bigger than ever. While Call of Duty 2 is hyping players up for cinematic set-piece moments, Gears of War popularizes taking cover as a way of changing the genre from run-and-gun to stop-and-pop. In the meantime, Ubisoft holds a series that's originally known for its tactical edge. Overhead map planning, slow walking, squad controls, and lethal gunplay. In the midst of the changing tides, they had been iterating on it for years, making it easier to control and understand. But with the release of new consoles and a new generation of players coming up, the publisher needed a new hit. A little more action, a little less tactics. More glitz and glamour, less grit and grime. That series was Rainbow Six, and Ubisoft decided to use it to take a little trip to Vegas. Smash and clear. Copy that. Before even getting to the game proper, however, I feel the need to mention how different a time this was. I'm often blindsided by how 2006 was, in fact, over a full decade ago, rather than a few years. High-speed internet of the time would be considered fairly average today. 4x3 standard definition TVs and computer monitors were still quite commonplace, with HD still being a big marketing term in paper ads. I, myself, played a DVD copy of this game purchased from a mall GameStop and played it on my compact brand computer with a dual-core Intel processor and a Radeon graphics card with one of those horribly garish depictions of a CG woman on it and a pack-in copy of Deus Ex Invisible War. All this is to say, we can only look back at older games with hindsight, and it's nigh impossible to see the game purely as it was, but only as it is compared to the memory of newer things. Even though I simply wanted to replay one of my favorite games from my childhood, I ended up noticing a lot more about the legacy of Rainbow Six when reviewing these titles, while thinking about what could have been. And so, with that, we'll take our first drop in. What's probably immediately apparent is that Rainbow Six Vegas does not start in Vegas. Rather, borrowing from more contemporary video games and decades of film history, the game starts with a small setup as a way to kickstart the story, or what it considers a story. First though, one needs to make mention of the new system introduced in this Rainbow Six game and then subsequently completely removed after the Vegas duology. Cover. Cover is such an instrumental part of this game that a lot of the design feels built around it, not just in the waist-high walls scattered about, but in the hard 90 degree angles which you navigate around that, without a lean function, are a death trap if you don't use said cover. It is so integral even that rather than using your right mouse or left trigger to aim down your gun's sights or use some kind of alternate fire like other games of its era, or even issue squad commands, it simply takes cover, smashing your viewpoint from first person to third. And the transition between them never feels quite right, regardless of the way the camera seems to whip back into your head and out of it during the animation. So as important as it is, I found myself not wanting to always use it because it threw me off, suddenly finding myself a few inches to a few feet to the left or the right of where I was standing a moment ago as my character, Logan Keller, suddenly slams himself back into a wall. What feels less constrictive, however, is the level design itself. Those perfectly angled kill walls aside, there's a certain openness to the areas that does let the gunplay breathe. While not as wide as or open as, say, the early Rainbow Six games or SWAT 4, the game still advertises your ability to flank enemies using alternate routes or by hugging a wall and sneaking past. It's nothing groundbreaking, but at the time, and even now, it feels nice to at least have the option of taking a less linear route through firefights. And said firefights are a big deal, as the time to death in the Vegas games is as unforgiving as ever. Even on the normal difficulty, just a few stray bullets are enough to take you down. That alone is one of the best and worst aspects of Vegas. It wants to play hardball with you, and expects you to take things slowly, use the cover system, wait for enemies to reload, or move yourself around for flanking opportunities, and most importantly, make good use of your squad. Glad you made it, Keller. I thought you took a hitter off the chopper back there. And failed his first assignment as team command? I doubt it. In position. In Mexico, you'll quickly meet up with squad mates Gabriel and Khan on a rooftop, and the game wastes little time setting up enemies coming from different angles to demonstrate the power of having two extra people on your side. This alone helps balance the scales throughout. With some rare flukes, Vegas does a good job of illustrating and sometimes demanding that you work together as a group of three people, if only because it will eventually throw enough enemies at you to make surviving alone impossible. 
While they're about as bland as store-bought cardboard in the personality department, something they did carry over from the older Rainbow Six games is their ability to actually kill enemies, which definitely took me by surprise today. And I think that's because I, like many people, had become conditioned to see allies and shooters as set dressing. They walk around, sometimes shoot stuff in the environment, but rarely score a kill for themselves for fear of taking it away from the player. In Vegas, however, they perform well, usually. For whatever reason, whether technical or by design, your squad mates are fully capable of using pinpoint accuracy to kill terrorists at most ranges when moved to a spot where they have an angle, but they sometimes have a seemingly impossible time getting just the last one down, except when they're ordered to clear a room. Open and clear. Confirmed. Well done, Logan. And clearing a room is where the gameplay of Rainbow Six Vegas shines brilliantly. While the more open areas give opportunities for the player to move and flank and offer some sort of spectacle, Rainbow Six is at its best when you can engineer it like a puzzle, which the room setups do amazingly. The process begins on approach, wherein you have to decide what door to set up your squad mates at and where to plant yourself. Then, is it silencers on or off? Putting them on means it'll take more bullets to drop enemies, but it also reduces the chances of the gunfire alerting the next room over, assuming there are even guards in there. Of course, you have to choose how to enter. By hitting a single button, you can change the rules of engagement for your allies from infiltrate, aka return fire only, to assault, or fire first. But even among those two, they each offer different ways of breaching a room, from throwing a smoke grenade in while you put thermal goggles on, to placing a C4 charge and blowing up whatever poor guy's hanging out on just the other side. Between these mechanics, plus the snake cam that lets you get a partial view of the room's interior, the button to tag people for a kill order, and the ability to act as a third member throwing your own grenades or placing charges, there's always an explosive dynamic to room clearing. It's the reason it was so popular in older games like SWAT 4, and why today there exist games that only employ that mechanic like door kickers and breach and clear. There are some problems though. Some are reasonable, some less so. The most common issue that arises is that, when ordering your squad to move somewhere, unless there's a nice long wall for cover, it's a total guess whether they'll intuitively split up against two walls facing the same direction, or one of them will just stand out in the open and most likely get down instantly. And as mentioned before, the same thing applies to you, except unlike your allies, you can't be revived when you die. To expand further, the lethality of Rainbow Six Vegas is a double-edged sword, and in more than one way. Terrorists go down extremely quick, but so do you and your squad, which creates a complicated problem. On one hand, it's neat to play a game where bullets do more than just scratch you for a time before finally deciding to do you in. On the other hand, it means that you can get absolutely murderized by someone you had little to no hope of even seeing before it happened. Additionally, it also means there's a small, but not impossible chance that your squad mates will line up to a door, breach it, and get shot in the head instantly, killing them and failing the mission. This was the other thing that struck me so much about going back. I'd remember the game being hard, sure, but not this absolutely punishing. For the longest time, I couldn't figure out if games had gotten easier as I got older, or I was simply less patient than I used to be. After spending a good portion of the first game staring at the retry screen, however, it suddenly hit me. The modern era of Call of Duty and its silk had trained me to walk into a fight, get shot a few times, and then figure out a plan while recovering in a safe spot. Now the order of operations had changed on me, and it took a good while to undo that muscle memory of just walking through the levels waiting to get shot first, rather than methodically pacing my way through each alley and corner expecting the worst, and therefore using cover and tactics. Does this mean that Rainbow Six Vegas is somehow better than Call of Duty in my eyes? Well, I wouldn't call instant deaths from rounding corners very fun or exciting. Realistic? Sure. Tense, maybe, but not much else. At the very least, they're interesting vistas to die at repeatedly. Since it's stamped right on the game's cover, the game wastes little time away from the titular city. Aside from a brief stay in Mexico, wherein you drop in, meet this game's villain, a woman named Myrene, and lose your squad mates Gabriel and Khan, you are suddenly whisked away to Vegas. Even the protagonist killer has little understanding of why go to Vegas beyond terrorists, or desire to because his squad was still left behind in Mexico. And if it wasn't for the later game plot twist, as well as a planned sequel, I would have no idea why we started in Mexico myself, except only to contrast the dull, brown, back alley streets with the blasting lights and blaring sounds of the City of Sin. And to the game's credit, the helicopter ride in is certainly a sight to see, depicting a lot of close approximations of real casinos whizzing by beneath you. The proper build-up continues as you're dropped onto the main strip, surrounded by cars, palm trees, and high-rises. Meeting your new squad mates Michael and Jung, who are by some miracle just as boring and flat as your former crew, you devise a plan. Work your way down the strip, breach into the back room of the casino, and push your way deeper inside. 
And that plays well from a level design perspective. The streets of the strip are crowded with cars and barriers, each of them possibly hiding some guy with a shotgun ready to one-shot you, which further emphasizes the need to push your squad ahead of you and move your way up slowly. Once you've made it to the marked wall, you breach inside, but even then it's only a tease. This is only the back rooms of the place, full of grey server and meeting rooms. Only after a few tense shootouts do you work your way through the hall, open a door, and... You're there. At first, the lights and sounds of the slot machines and tables are almost overwhelming, but it isn't long before the gunfire returns to its steady pace. Even that is bolstered by the setting though, as there's something novel about Rainbow Six's tactical combat and nearly deadpan serious tone thrown against the whimsical and inviting lights of the quarter slots. And when the fight is over and the gunfire ceases, these slots keep chirping away as the music from the overhead PA system fills the soundscape once more. During those gunfights, another one of Rainbow Six's best qualities arises to the forefront, and it was yet another moment that really took me aback playing it today. It all has to do with the way loadouts work. See, before the start of a mission, and even multiple times during it, the player can change their entire set of guns, gadgets, and grenades for literally anything else. And that in of itself creates some of the most mechanical freedom I've seen in a while. For as much as I enjoy modern shooters, the issue they've always suffered from is what I would call authored content. Which is to say set pieces that all but require an exact set of guns and rules to be followed to perform properly. Consider the myriad of four stealth sections, or how in games like Gears of War the enemies only drop certain guns such that you have to use that particular one for a bit. I think that comes from a design incentive to have the player both use a wide variety of guns that were painstakingly made for the game, as well as to make sure they have a fun time using said guns. Put another way, the past two mentioned games won't give you a sniper rifle in close quarters level because it's just not that practical. But because of Rainbow Six Vegas' do-anything system, it's certainly possible to use the same guns for literally every fight and do okay, but that means that the player is free to take out a sniper rifle and shotgun just because. It did occasionally mean I had a poor setup for a few rooms or so, but I appreciated that it was my doing. And if I really wanted to, I could scavenge something off one of the terrorists. The other, just as important aspect worth noting, is that while there are stats attached to the guns, there are no level restrictions put in place locking you out of certain weapons. Keller, and by proxy the player, can use anything at any time, and that means some guns are objectively better than others. In fact, not every gun really has a use, or at least not a great one, and that's okay. Some shotguns and sniper rifles are there purely for the fun of using them, for the tiniest little details that separate them, and that was the most I felt the tug between Rainbow Six's legacy and the games it was competing with. All this is what the 2006 Rainbow Six game did best in the market at the time. Introducing a new, more flamboyant backdrop and lots of combat variety helped the game feel really fresh and personally quite memorable over a decade later. What aspect of then modern game design didn't help Rainbow Six was the need for a cinematic storyline. Dr. Williams, are you hurt? Never mind that! You need to get me to safety! There's a bomb in this building! Bomb? The microphone! For God's sake! The terrorists brought me here to modify the two bombs they had. One was a crude micropulse. The other one was a conventional explosive that they moved to that building over there! Parker! Look out! Granted, this was the era of when linear shooters were beginning to display story chops, but before they got great, and it shows. Even after multiple playthroughs when I was younger, I still had virtually no memory of the actual narrative of Vegas 1, and replaying it now, I found I could pin that problem down to a few reasons. One was that the audio mixing is horrendous. Like, so bad I began to question if it wasn't designed for headphones and computer speakers, but more likely TV speakers or such. Logan, you're alive. Save your strength, buddy. Vegas isn't... isn't the target. There's something... bigger. The lack of subtitles as an option sincerely didn't help. The other problem was the strangely prophetic notion I had that this was just a small step in a larger Rainbow Six narrative. Even, even if I could follow it, the sudden betrayal by Gabriel, who you've said all of a few words to before, hurts it more. All you do is watch his helicopter fly away, but it all ends in a halting, to-be-continued screen with credits. It's a really flat ending, trying to bring a swift last second hook with absolutely no weight behind it. 
Before we continue on, there are some other aspects of Vegas 1 that bear mentioning, like the gamut of online modes. Sadly, it's been quite some time since this game had any kind of popularity and community behind it, so I enlisted a few of my friends to remind me just how aged my memories of this game's online really are. Yeah, it's this map, by the way. Oh god. Oh Jesus oh, Christ! God. It's already gone to shit! <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. This already sucks so bad. It's like one piece of cover! Being a mid-2000s game, of course, there were problems right off the bat. In order to play online, I needed to log into a Ubisoft account first, and though I thought my login information wouldn't work as I know I created my current account long after Vegas came out, it certainly did, but not in the way I expected. It wouldn't take my username, likely because I changed the display name at some point, yet for whatever reason, it accepted my email address as my username. And weirdly, it displays my email address as my username too. Strangely, a friend of mine with a similar situation to me could not log on no matter what. This seems like something that would never fly in today's online world, but how it happened back then, I have no idea. All that said, how are the modes? Well, the co-op story mode is somehow like others of the era and yet worse. It's alike in that players 2 through 4 simply work alongside you through the campaign's levels with no real context or extra dialogue at all. Think Halo 1 and 2 with the multiple Master Chiefs running around? Unlike Halo though, or Gears of War, or every co-op shooter of the 7th generation of consoles, the game completely strips out all of the non-player allied characters and leaves the levels in this strange state wherein they feel much more mechanically designed. There are no helicopter briefings with Joan, no AI squad mates to command a banter with, even the enemies no longer exist as obstacles for the sake of the narrative however threadbare it was, but now just roam the streets and casinos. It feels almost like a theme park shooting gallery complete with extras all ready to play their part rather than an actual mission with stakes. And if you played the co-op story first, you wouldn't know why this is the case, as there's no menu or anything telling you the story will be removed entirely if you want to enjoy the campaign levels with a friend. It's utterly bizarre, but does it invalidate the co-op entirely? Not really. It still has moments when you can set up with a friend to hit a room at the same time from opposite sides, but it goes far to show how much removing one piece of the set can leave the rest feeling incredibly video gamey, for lack of a better word. What I spent most of my younger years playing was Terrorist Hunt. For my teenage friends and I, it was one of the mainstays on months on end between Halo 3 Slayer sessions and Gears of War 2 Horde mode completion attempts. In short, I was incredibly excited to give it another shot. What? Nope. Uh, uh, Everything's uh, dark now. It got dark. There's his finger. <laughs> It's just his hand. Yeah, it sure. It sure is. I murdered him through his fist. To say I was disappointed would be an understatement, and it's not even the game's fault. Playing Terrorist Hunt today is exactly like it was in 2006. Pick a loadout, a map, a skin for your character, and adjust a few sliders for difficulty and load in. It is exactly the way it used to be, and time hasn't been kind to it. Once a bastion of pure combat with a splash of RNG enemy placement, the lack of really complex gadgets or abilities really saps a lot of the life out of this mode today. I really wanted to say that the simplicity remained a testament to the pure quality of Terrorist Hunt, but instead it ends up feeling like a tacked on survival mode thrown in to fill the empty space on the back of the box. I can't say the game would be better without it, as it's not awful. But it doesn't make good use of the mechanics at hand, because of the quick deaths at play and the random placement of enemies across the entire map. The chances of you getting shot from behind if you dare to move around are higher than one would like, leading my friends and I to simply turtle up with the spawn point and wait for them to come to us once they hurt the gunfire. This leaves the adversarial modes, and this one was hurt the most by our small group. Since only three of us could even get into matches, the maps felt way too large for us, giving us upwards of five minutes of walking around in circles around one another until someone was spotted and killed before they could even react. At least in my memory, it was more fun with a full match, giving flanking opportunities to teammates while someone lays suppressing fire, but I can't speak whether that even holds up by today's standards. And therein lies the issue with Rainbow Six Vegas 1. It was a game caught right on the cusp of a new era of shooters, coming in so close it was somehow trying to chase trends while creating its own wake behind it. But with 2006 winding to a close, Vegas saved, and they're presumably everyone returning to the casinos to gamble and drink once the bodies got moved out of the way, where does Rainbow Six Vegas go next? Follow me and keep low. 
The influence of 2007's Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare on almost every preceding shooter cannot be overstated. Its single player campaign, though tightly scripted and seen more critically today, was well beloved at the time for its storytelling and cinematic set piece moments. More importantly, its multiplayer, leveraging a leveling system that unlocked unique guns, attachments, and perks, always kept the player engaged match after match, day by day, and on and on for years to come. Ever since then, it's felt like shooters have almost universally employed some variant of leveling in their multiplayer in an effort to keep people playing, and will shoehorn in whatever cinematic moments they can into their plot to hopefully have players thinking about it some years down the line when a sequel is almost upon them. Yeah, that turret sequence was very exciting. Let me get the new one of these. What I mean by all of this is the shadow of Call of Duty, nay all 7th generation shooters, looms large over Rainbow Six Vegas 2. From the moment I booted up the game for the first time, it was already throwing rewards at me for playing the first one, welcoming me back into the fold with an arm around my shoulder, assuring me that I shouldn't be concerned about the sudden influx of player levels in the campaign, and to just boot up a new save and give it a shot. And so I did, and favorably, the upgrade and presentation was noticeable from the outset. To begin, the UI actually displays in 16x9 now, so it started off on a good foot. After departing the helicopter, I was at once met with the beautiful vista of the snow-capped mountains of the Pyrenees and slowly walked into a room to be debriefed. It was all shaping up to be leagues more interesting than the first game, but it couldn't last. Bishop. It's been a while, D. It has. You look... different. Even several years on from the first entry, Vegas 2 still can't make the characters act like anything other than mannequins pantomiming at me when they stand up, and it was at that moment that made me realize why all of the first game's briefings took place in that helicopter. For as much as Vegas 2 tries to pull its engine together to make a plot that could matter, and at least be slightly compelling, it falls apart at every conceivable angle. Characters are stilted and robotic not only in their movement, or lack thereof, but also in most of their delivery. Hostages, and I made the call to save them first. It was a textbook situation. Hundreds of people just died! I made the call, not you. <sighs> We're team. And I'm team leader. We have a job to do. Even so, the game really wants me to care through the sheer amount of banter your squad mates and you yourself deliver. Seemingly after almost every combat encounter, someone will have some witty or solemn comment to make about the action that happened moments before. And if they don't, someone will definitely pop over the radio to give you new instructions. With the exception of one level that removes your squad mates and communications, which itself is pretty poor, all the game's attempts at trying to be more expository and character driven fall flat in a way that reminded me a lot of the later seasons of the TV show 24 and other lower budget shows trying to replicate its style. Now in this Rainbow Six, there's chase scenes, intense moments where your squad mate, whose name you probably don't even remember and only ever said things like good kill mate, in the first game now questions how well he does his job, and intrigue too. Or at least the gesture of it, as the traitor Gabriel Novak is back once more with deadly intent to take down all of Team Rainbow. Frankly though, it's flat, it's boring, and usually just plain confusing, since Vegas 2 does double duty as a prequel and a sequel. And as such, this brings us back to Vegas 1. Taking place purely after the events of the first game would leave no Vegas left to shoot through, as that situation was already resolved. But doing a prequel meant Ubisoft had a chance to maybe shove in a few casinos from before Vegas 1's leads Logan Keller arrived on the scene. Instead, the game, in some poor attempt to create variety or maybe avoid story conflicts, opts to stray away from Vegas, or at least the one the tourists know of. Rather, Rainbow Six Vegas 2 takes place in the grittier, seedier underworld of... Vegas? Yes, the game does take place in Las Vegas, Nevada, but looking at most of the levels, you could be forgiven for thinking it was any number of real or fictitious cities across the United States. 
Despite its title, Vegas 2 has even less to do with its namesake, and that means that its areas are distinctly less memorable than the first game. In spite of that, however, one would be hard-pressed to argue that the gameplay of Vegas 2 is any worse in any regard. There's a lot of small improvements made here that do a lot to help the flow of combat, from letting you command your squad mates to use their grenades in the middle of a fight instead of just at doors, to having more options at said doors. Even tiny quality of life improvements are made, like the tactical map opening much quicker than before. Sincerely, it adds up in a way that makes Rainbow Six Vegas 2 much more enjoyable to play moment by moment, even if the changes to equipment and leveling hampered the game in the long run. First though, I need to mention the systems that support these changes. The first of them, called Aces, is introduced at the start of the game. It stands for Advanced Combat Enhancements and Specialization, but what it really is is a challenge-based way of gaining gear and experience. In this, Rainbow Six was a bit of ahead of its time, though the games of today usually only surface a few of these challenges a day in the form of dailies. Aces is a much more long-term job. Depending on how the player performs, they'll gain points in some specific division, and those can go all the way up to level 20 per division, with each unlocking weapons behind its ranks. In theory, this is a fun and engaging way to reward the player for playing the game in a way they seem to enjoy it, but in practice, I immediately found I was racking up points in Marksman every fight, but could not for the life of me get CQB or Assault points. Due to Vegas 2 being just about as lethal in combat as the first game, there's no real incentive to run up to enemies and hit them up close with shotguns, or use grenades, or kill while repelling beyond the Aces system itself. More often than not, without proper use of your partners and some pure luck, you'll die trying anything outside of long-range headshots. And ultimately, that's fine. There was no incentive in Vegas 1, and yet I pulled out random builds and setups purely for the fun of using them, because combat was rewarding enough to try even though I died a lot doing so. But in even trying to solve the problem by making a CQB or Assault farm build, or simply ignoring aces altogether, a new issue arises. There's another leveling system at play as well, and it first appears to be a non-harmful broad character level. In this system, Ubisoft saw it fit to not only gain access to most of the weapons behind it and not just the multiplayer, but the single player as well. This means that my earlier praise for the lack of authored content in Rainbow Six Vegas 1 is only half true here. For what it's worth, you can still choose between a selection of guns and now armor as well at almost any point, as there's no designated sniper mission or such, but you only have a few options available now. There's no longer at the start the option to bring just a riot shield, revolver, a shotgun, and some C4. The shield is locked behind level 20 of the Assault Aces division, the revolver behind a character level. Even most of the shotguns are locked away at the start. That means there's a lot of grinding just for the chance to use this kind of loadout, and that's hoping the player even likes it if they decide to grind for these without knowing. Even in that extreme particular scenario aside, I found myself disappointed that guns I loved in Vegas 1 were now arbitrarily locked away from me, along with new ones I would have really liked to try out. It's something I can understand in a multiplayer only setting, as it's designed to be repetitive by nature, but in single player it was just upsetting. So then, with the gunplay variety kneecapped, what becomes of the story that Vegas 2 invested so much effort into? Nothing. Following the standard sequel format of, this time it's personal, your team lead and playable character Bishop has a past with Gabriel and Keller depicted in the first mission, wherein you find out that Gabriel was too hot-headed and assertive to work on a team, and of course you were there, leading him the moment he broke, making it that much more personal when you have to take him down yourself at the end game by yourself, and he's in a helicopter. I honestly do not understand why this was designed this way, beyond only wanting to have a cinematic moment at the end of the game with lots of gunfire and explosions, even though by the standards of Rainbow Six and earlier Tom Clancy games, a small ending wherein you and your squad pair up with Keller's team to breach a room together and take down Gabriel would have had made much more thematic sense and better use the mechanics at play. Alas, this is the era of Call of Duty and Gears of War, which means its spectacle was reigning supreme. As such, for whatever cool factor the game had at the time, a lot of those sequences have aged especially poorly. And that's the real shame of it. So much work put into the presentation, yet it just wasn't what the game was designed for. But before we close, we need to take a look at the multiplayer for Vegas 2, however briefly. This time, my friend that couldn't play before could this time, so that's a bonus, and yet, try as I might, I still was not able to get the game to display anything other than my email, which made me at least slightly thankful that the multiplayer lobbies were empty. Who are you? Yeah, so this version has my squads, which is weird, right? Like the first time, we tried out the co-op story, and I feel like they took a good step forward with this one. Your co-op partner now does not erase your squad from existence with their arrival, and can see the waypoints and tags you place for your team. It's not terribly exciting, but a well-appreciated fix. 
Oh, I, I got killed from behind. Oh, he's going back down the stairs. <laughs> he's oh, fucking no. killed you and left. That's funny. That's <laughs> fucked up. <laughs> That's <laughs> fucked up. <laughs> they are like real players. They just grab their one kill and leave. <laughs> Next, we dove into Terrorist Hunt again, and what held true of the first game does now as well. The enemies are smart enough to climb ladders and open doors to kill you quickly, but not enough to know when to wait for us to come to them. Our moments were definitely more intense, but that was likely due to us being acclimated to the mode and wanting to push through the level as we played rather than just hang back as much. I personally found the maps to be a bit more engaging, further leveraging the verticality present in the first game's multiplayer maps. And while the addition of night versions seems interesting, we quickly found out the night vision goggles were wholly unnecessary. That leaves adversarial multiplayer, where unfortunately all we could test with three people again was deathmatch and realism deathmatch. The former works the same as before, and again, though we tried to move around the maps more this time, it became apparent a few matches in that the slow pace, gadgets, and most importantly third person cover system all tell the player to hunker down a camp of spot. It's probably why I remember playing the objective modes much more back in the day, and without a good reason to go out into the open, cover peeking is much too powerful. I would like to say the realism variant of Deathmatch changed things, as one of the advertised features was a tighter cover camera, but while it did accomplish its goal of removing the ability to peek, it makes one wonder why bother using cover at all rather than just hiding behind a wall. So all in all, a better offering of maps, though without committing to the grind, a smaller set of weapons and gadgets to use them. I mentioned at the beginning that we can only look back to the past with hindsight, and that's especially true here. Maybe I would have had a great time with the multiplayer if I had played as much more of it back then, grinding away multiple levels a day and doing different builds, but that's just about impossible today, so all I can do is ask, what if? The Rainbow Six Vegas games were never leaders of their era. In fact, the desire to push towards marketing trends hurt the series more than it helped. I'll still always have a fondness for them though, not only because of nostalgia, but also because they brought their own brand of squad-based gameplay to a generation that sorely lacked it. For as much as I love and still play Gears of War and Halo and Call of Duty and such, Vegas 1 and 2 will always be remembered by me as the gateway series that got me more interested in tactical gameplay, and I'll forever be grateful for that. Had I diluted his complex mechanics just a little bit to help appeal to more people, I might have never touched it, and then not realized how interested I was in the past games and others like it years down the line. They were the right games at the right time. And problems and all, I still had a blast revisiting them. My name is Sam Callahan, and thanks for watching. With the credits rolling, I want to give a super special thanks to my friend Brandon Carey for reviewing and critiquing my original script for me. Also, this is my first ever critique video, and like many of my projects, it blew up in scope over time. Uh, I had originally thought it was going to be like a 10 to 15 minute review, and here we are passing the half hour mark. That being said, if you do have any critiques, suggestions for me, or just want to say how much you enjoyed the video, I'd really love to hear it. You can do so in the comments below, or over at the new Twitter account I just made, underscore underscore Sam Callahan. And if you want to see more from me, you can like the video and subscribe to the channel. It'd really mean a lot to me. Thanks again, y'all, and until next time.